I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. I don't know if you watched it yet, but uh, the final volume of Stranger Things is out. I have not. I, I have a recommendation for you, though. Is it to watch it or is it to not watch it? Watch it, but also, until you watch it, do not go on Twitter. There's oh, is it spoiler heavy? The trending tag for for Stranger Things Volume Two for me spoiled what happened to a character. Oh no, there's. I mean the the. <laughs> this is actually a really good segue into something. Luckily, I have I have three uh, Twitter accounts, and um, I'll just stay off uh. my real account for. That way, because the trending on my other ones is uh, much different. I, I, you say that the one is not going to end up being is not a real account, but I, I am still convinced that you are going to end up being having make making a sauce like dealership type it's, thing. This you is, are it's, going to make a sauce. It's a long saying. game, and it's 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 not out of the question. And I, I could try to figure stuff out, depending on how big of an investment it would be to have. Anyway, there's um, so so the 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 I'll, I I'm fine telling people now because I I told our Discord when I thought it was gone forever, and now it's back. Um, it was pretty close. The I found out that the Twitter account at Heinz is just some guy whose last name is Heinz, and that means that the Heinz food company. All of their real accounts are at Heinz UK, at Heinz Tweets, at Heinz History. So I thought it would be it would lend some viability to if I made an account called at Heinz Canada, and I was having fun. And I, it's it's on Throwback Thursdays. I found an archive of like old Heinz ads. So I'm, tr- I'm trying to look pretty pretty real. Is but Throwback Thursday still a thing? I don't know, but if someone goes to view the account's tweets, it'll make it look like a real company account. Um, and then I just started trying to fight some fast food companies, and it was fu- I was having fun. Fuddruckers started following me. The Toronto Maple Leafs started following me, and then I I tried to fight Sunny D. And uh, not too long after that, my account got locked. So Sunny D's a fucking rat, mm-hmm. and reported my account, and it was done. And I have a backup plan that I'm still working on, and we'll see if the if if it's going to keep running in the background. This backup plan, but then. More real companies and hockey teams kept following my account, even though it was locked. And Thursday, the Ontario Senators hockey team put out a um, a tweet that said, "Tell us your on Canada Day your barbecue food combination, and we will give you signed jerseys courtesy of at Heinz Canada, which is me." Amazing, not Heinz. And uh, on that same day, uh. Twitter also apparently decided to unlock my account, which was locked for violating their, their terms and conditions for impersonating a corporate entity. So apparently they decided I'm not. Um, so I have my account back. I had to turn off notifications because, you know, I got, the last time I looked, 136 people told me what their favorite, like, barbecue combo is. My phone was just going off. But their account's back! And more uh, Swedish Fish and Sour Patch Kids just started following me. Um, I'm I'm gonna try to not fly so close to the sun and try to avoid any circles with Sunny D. <laughs> I was gonna say like right before like you got it banned, I was like, I was thinking to myself, I didn't say this to you, but I'm like, he's flying pretty damn close to the sun on this one. Yeah, I mean, but it's 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 so much fun and just talk talking shit to people. And um, what did I Brandon- say yesterday? Mythical Kitchen put something out and the, about sauces. Oh, it's about their sport, favorite, which is their new sports. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah, sports put something about about like, um, what's your favorite food that's no longer on the shelf? So I, I got a nice little 
uh, jab in there about like, well, maybe if they weren't sh- if they weren't shit, they'd still be on the shelf. Hashtag top dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so much fun. I don't know why it's so much fun. It's so much uh, fun. I, I don't. I don't know. You. You've been making. You've been doing things and doing I've, science. I've been yeah. Sure. And I'm I'm excited to see where my my backup my my uh plan B uh happens uh where where, where that's gonna end up in the future for when the Heinz account goes down. I mean, for all we know, they might just hire you as like, all right, I guess you're our fucking brand manager now for yeah, Heinz they Canada. They just start paying me. They're just like, <laughs> fuck it. That oh, and here's the even funnier thing. There is a Heinz Canada account that exists, but its naming convention doesn't match the naming convention of any of the other real Heinz accounts. What? They have a, it has an underscore. None of the other Heinz accounts have an underscore. That's weird. So that, that's probably why they, uh, cause I'm sure you know, these, com- like so whoever runs their Twitter accounts isn't vetting like the account first. So they just started incorporating my account because it's the naming convention of their other like foreign accounts mm-hmm. my uh so sorry sorry to at heinz underscore ca little bitch yeah they did they did a bad <laughs> job they, they pulled on me yeah. when i set up my um they pulled on me when i set up my account for reddit for lab that i'm in because I accidentally yeah. switched the order of our lab, and I started with RIT instead of Niantic, and that was wrong. But oh. I also now have, I also can't just change the name, and um, I now have, like, oh. bona fides slash evidence that I'm an ex- existing, like, human being, and I got all of my shit, like, verified, and I don't feel like doing that again. <laughs> so that's my life. Yeah. Yeah. I also got, I think, I posted this to the Discord, but I got invited into an e-girl Discord channel from Phasmophobia. I saw and I'm that. just like, there was a part of me that was uh-huh. like, I want to click this because I want to see what, like, what is happening here. Because, like, legitimately, yeah. I don't understand what the point of this Discord server is, right? Because, because the fact of the matter is, like, <laughs> yeah, e girls don't need a Discord to get people horny for them. They already got TikTok. No. They already got Instagram. They already got Twitter. Like, no, that that's just a thing that happens. Yeah, you know, they they just all they have to do is just like, it's not hard, right? Not hard to get a sim because there's so many yeah. of them out there. But like, there is this part of me that was just like. I really desperately want to know what's going on here, but I don't care enough to make yeah. a new account because you better fucking believe that the second I log into that with my account, I am going to get e-girl spam for the rest of my account's existence. <laughs> if you will. I almost made a joke about um, people owning body pillows, um, but then I remembered, so... Um, I got a pregnancy pillow for Erica when she was pregnant, but she didn't like it, but I mm-hmm. still use it every single day. It is yeah, so good. So I get it. I'm going to buy you pillows. a, uh, I'm going to buy you like a body pill- pillow cover that just has a big foot, like being embarrassed and like covering their private parts. Oh, that's perfect. Oh, get something off, um, doll E mini, like, uh, anime. Oh, waifu Bigfoot. <gasps> what would happen if we did a dolly of waifu Bigfoot? I don't know. You can find that out because my computer will literally die if I try to do Dolly Mini on here. Um, there, I think they're migrating mm, it to a different place. They they fixed the servers, so it actually does stuff now. Waifu, big foot. So I'm gonna run. I'm gonna start doing the episode now while you uh, let that run. So last week, Brandon, sure. Um, well, two weeks ago, we talked about the Ningen, right? Which is like. We it's did. a weird thing that is definitely, definitely a two-channel like thing. Okay, real. Yeah, we got, we got. Yeah, yeah it's it's yeah, a two-channel. We pretty origin, much know yeah. for a fact. Um, so in the Jackalopes channel, uh, Will Smith 
Wiki Wiki Wild, Wild Wild West. Um, he made a he made a request for uh some more yokai lore, and that request was for the Umibozo. Now, uh, have you ever heard of the Umibozo? Oh, nice. <laughs> never. I got the waifu Bigfoot results. I've oh, never no. heard of Umi Boza. Uh, just post post the image into into di- like the channel's Discord, just so we have it, and then. Oh, it's going into general. Yeah, okay. Um. So before we get again, I'm using my my primary source for this week's episode is hyakamanagatori dot com. Um, and there's an article by Zach Davison from 2012. It really is just a collaboration of like pretty much all of the English available English language sources about Umibozo because it turns out there are not many. <laughs> um oh, God. So Brandon, let's let's imagine we're in the 1700s Japan. Okay? I'm imagining. Paint me a word picture, daddy. That hurts me. Um so imagine you're a fisherman in 1700s Japan. Right? Uh there's some dumb shit happening in North America, but, like, let's be real. You're probably not. You have no inkling of that. Because, like, you, you're a fisherman. That's all you're doing. Literally, all you're trying to do is keep your family fed at this point, right? Because, like, it's the 1700s. So like, yeah. Fucking whatever. Um, so, while in the open sea, you notice that a previously calm sea... Oh, God. It's not the end of the episode. <laughs> There's no one's ever this sleepy at noon. I woke up like like three checks ago, so because I fell asleep <laughs> at three. I think. Yeah. Like a normal human. That's not uh, well, how normal humans are. Brandon, I'm like uh, my my whole schedule is fucked, so doesn't matter. You're not you're no longer human. You're, you're just John Sapien. Yeah, actually the whole no longer human thing is like a very big Part of my therapy. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Okay. Because like a major part of my like my constellation of issues is that I refuse to accept my humanity. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so yeah, there's that. So um, basically, sees calm, but suddenly it starts to get a little tumultuous. You know, there's a little bit more waves, wave action. Start rocking the boat, right? Your stomach sinks, um, but you know you're mm-hmm. you're a seasoned fisherman, so it's not because of the waves. Instead, it's because a massive dark form emerges from the sea, and it's not uh, the drummer from the gorillas. It's not. It's not Shaq or Shaq. <laughs> hey there. What was? What was the name? Of I'm the in drum every commercial. Gorillas, like Randall or something. Uh, drummy, drummy, boy, boy. Uh, I think it'd be Russell. I was close. Um, so it's not Russell. Uh, which have you ever read the lore for the gorillas? I have not. So Russell during the Plastic Beach era becomes like a giant, right? And the reason uh-huh. that he becomes a giant in the official like lore pollution, just blanket pollution. Oh, perfect. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, so anyways, uh, not Russell, raises from the sky. The top of the shape is smooth and sphere, uh, is a smooth spherical, uh, hemisphere, right? And it appears to have what are two Uh eyes looking straight ahead, uh, as though the entire thing is a giant 10 meter tall black head, right? Yeah. Um, you don't have much time to process because your ship has been scuttled by the resultant wave from the Mubozo, um... And you're slowly, you know, drowning from there, right? Disappearing into the the deep. Yeah, they look, they look like a mix of, um, at least in the artwork that you've got here, of those things from my neighbor Totoro. If they were were like had a baby with a tentacruel. Are you talking about the spirits, the Kadama spirits from my neighbor Totoro? Kadama, Kadama, Kodama, K O D. AMA. Uh, no. They're like a bunch of black, um, squiggly scribbles. See, you're talking about the soot sprites, Brandon, and that is not my name. Yes! Of Totoro. What are the soot sprites from? 
the soot sprites are from uh, Spirited Away. So. No, they're they're in uh, they're in Totoro. The soot sprites. Yeah, if you type in soot sprites Totoro. Oh, that's right. They appear they when they clean the bathtub. Yeah. yeah. But Spirit Away also I'm so excited to get my daughter on like all this all this uh uh, uh stuff. Um but yeah, if a soot sprite and a tentacruel had a baby. But like then they cut all the tentacruel's leg off. Yeah, but it, it was kind of into it. Is it like why does it have to be into it? Is my question. Because if it's not, it's kind of sad. I also like the little one in the background. It's a uh, kind of that that one didn't come out quite right. The little one is it? That's supposed to just be that it's far away. Yeah, but its face is kind of fucked up. But it's it, like it's got no pupils. But it's because it's far away, so like you have less definition. You have less definition, it's but usually, Brandon, it's as things get farther away, uh, they tend to, they get darker in most art. So yeah, so, but so but, this implies it's like a, an albino, a blind albino version that's what? in the distance. No, it doesn't. If it's like a hot day, the haze will slowly fade it out. There's ah, uh, it's this is open ocean, Brandon. This image is of open ocean. It is not going to get darker because there's not like less sunlight. Uh, <clears throat> maybe I don't know. I don't know. I, that's I don't know. Uh, I still think it's a funky, it's a funky looking one. I mean, it looks funny, but it's, that's what it's supposed to be. This looks like the next Sea of Thieves update. Which does? The, this artwork. The, for that one? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, which this artwork is on some of the sources, but it's also in the, the show notes. Um, or the, the show copy that we post to Patreon. Um, so in addition to being known as the Umi Bozo, it has been known as the Umi Hoshi in the Umi Nyodo. The Umi Bozo is a particular type of folklore vendor entity emerging from the yokai tradition of Japan. Uh, the last creature type we talked about from Japan um, was the internet legend of the Ningen. Ningen? Wow, I am nailing it today with my pronunciations. Um, well, beyond the Ningen was uh, the Yure in Onryo, right? So if you'll remember, yep. I did a two-episode series on those, Oiwa and Kuchisaki Ona. Um, and now, there are some stories that say that the creature is formed, the Umibozo, is formed from a dead human, right? Um, okay. I pretty much have seen that the Umibozo is more or less de designated as a yokai, right? Um which is the more general catch-all term for Japanese monsters. Now, all three of the, the Umibozo's monikers can roughly be translated to sea priest or sea monk. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a little bit different because, like, Nyodo is, like, virtuous or something along those lines. Hoshi yeah. is another thing. And then, like, there's a young version of it for small ones that they have. But, like, long story short, Umi refers to sea. Second half represents some way to describe virtuous or holy, right? Okay. Um, the interesting thing, though, is a lot of the times things are named for, like, what they do, yeah. right? Although I guess that's not true, because Bigfoot's named because of the feet, right? Yeah. Yeah, I take that back. <clears throat> Actually, most things are named because of what they look like. Bigfoot, um, moth, moth man, man yeah. bat. Yeah. Jersey Devil. Yeah. Fro There's a lot Loveland of them. Frog, frog Boys. Loveland frog Man. Yeah, yeah. I, I take everything back. Um, the Wolf Man. But instead... Yeah, pretty much. I, I all the white up. things. I get it. Pretty much all <laughs> the white things. All the white people. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> anywho, the... Uh, the <laughs> I'm just, I'm just picturing, like, just a normal guy in Virginia, and everyone's like, fuck, fuck, and, like, slapping their buddy on the shore, like, get your phone, get your phone, there's a Dale. <laughs> it's just some normal guy, and he's like, why does everybody act like this? Well, Dale's a cryptid, <clears throat> okay? So he looks like just one of us, and he's like, I am one of you! I, I knew somebody whose name was Dale. 
um, I didn't know them. I knew their sister, right, during college. Yeah. Um, we were both commuters, and, like, there was, like, a commuter, like, there was, like, a commuter social place, right? Yeah. So, like, during classes, you go there, sit, chill out, you know, do all that stuff. Yeah, like a commuter area. Yeah. So I was friends, I was friends with this person on, on Facebook because I was friends with everyone in the commuter area. And their brother just started randomly messaging me one day. And their name was Dale, and I was so confused. <laughs> and then I brought it up with them in the, the commuter lounge, and they were like, oh, I told them to not do stuff like that, or something to that effect. Yeah. So apparently this is a repeating trend for this individual. And he was younger. He was like still in high school. And it's like, I'm not going to talk to a high school student. I am sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. I am I am an adult. I I am not an adult by my standards now, but I am an adult who has graduated high school. Anyone talking to someone in high school who's in college currently yeah, who didn't already have an active relationship with that person as a friendship or whatever. Stop. Just stop. It's real. <laughs> yeah. We are not in the adults in our own eyes. We are only adults in the eyes of the state. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's that's the thing with, with college in general, right? Uh, when you're in your undergrad. Yeah. You are technically an adult. But like you're super bad at it. <laughs> you're not you're not there yet. Yeah. You're not there yet. Yeah, you're making some decisions, is all I'm saying. Yeah. Um, although then again, I don't know how it is for this generation, because, like, let's face it, they had to deal with some shit growing up. Yeah. So, like, they might be more adult than us at that age, but who the fuck knows? I don't know. I mean, they definitely have a lot of deep fried memes, that's for sure. Lots of super greasy memes. Yeah. Um... So the Umabozo moniker actually is more likely to emerge from the rounded part quality of its head. Okay. And the smooth shape was said by those who saw it uh, and lived, which is rare, uh, to resemble a monk's shaved head. Oh, okay. So that's why... And that's why it's called the Umabozo. Gotcha. Yeah. That makes sense now. Um, interestingly, there's like a weird... like So the Umabozo is a weird particular type of yokai because it has such like a broad definition for what, what it could be yeah right so the most popular look is the one that we described earlier which is uh like a, a sheet ghost mm -hmm. you know like the stereotypical one although the sheet in this case is black and it has white eyes yeah right um that's pretty much the main descriptor for it um and within that form there's variations some are incarnations don't have eyes. Uh, others have the entity being transparent or translucent. Um, and then there are even some depictions of it as being like a shadow with the upper torso of a human being. Although it's you know, giant. Uh, the only like consistent thing is you never see the bottom half of it. That's like the pretty much the most consistent thing across all the iterations. It's like a spooky both. iceberg. Kind of. It's like a spooky iceberg that does some weird shit as we'll get into in a second, as opposed to a regular iceberg. Now, um, depictions of this iteration have been around since at least the Edo period. Uh, however, there are some radically different depictions, which uh, if you're in the copy, you, you'll see that there's one that's very different from the first two. It's like a, like a um, catfish with a bald head. Yeah, basically. So also hailing from the Edo, peri Edo period is a hand-painted depiction of the Umibozo. And in this case, the entity, as Brandon has stated, resembles a combination of a catfish and a sea serpent. Right? Because, like, the head is a catfish, but then it's got, like, a long, slithery body after yeah. it. But you can't see the end of it because, of course, not. Um, although, despite the radical differences in form, the rounded, rounded bald head is still preserved, indicating how central, like, this rounded quality to the head is to the yeah. eye. Right? Um... There are also additional iterations of the Umubozo that I couldn't find images of that sport hair on the body, resemble sperm whales, and have various varying forms of distressing anatomy, which is pretty much like the like the given for yokai. Um, just, just, just distressing. 
just yeah i think you kind of like yeah. to hit the so, almost uncanny valley it, with some of their uh like uh, it'd be a normal human except there's no bottom jaw or whatever i'd call that more yure on rio okay right like it personally yeah. Cause like yokai are more like monsters. It's a wheel that's it's a wheel that has a face on it that's constantly screaming yeah. and spewing fire. That's a yokai. Okay. Where it's like, it's like, what the fuck did you just say to me? Yeah. Um, it's like it, it's a giant skeleton that's larger than the the seven foot skeletons from Home Depot. Because there's a yokai that is just a massive fucking skeleton. <laughs> That terrorizes the country. So My bones. Um. Then there's like <laughs> the the <laughs> quick call Clifford. <laughs> <laughs> he just ravages that fucking thing. So Clifford's an interesting character because I have a question. Do you consider Clifford a kite? Um. Do I? How big is Clifford now? Because I think his size is pretty fluid. It's pretty fluid because it's a children. It's a children. Yeah. Uh, Clifford images. Um, I would not, because he fits inside of buildings. No. Well, he fits. He fits into like a brownstone. How big are Clifford's poops? Did, uh, did you just like yell that at your phone or Alexa or something? No, I I looked. I typed. I typed in Clifford the Big Red Dog height, and the first question that people ask. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> How big are Clifford's, Clifford's poops? poops? Appear for to be. For Clifford, Hind continues. Wait, wait. There's there's like a whole thing. There's a whole thing. Uh, for Clifford, Hind continues. The pile of poop has to be multiplied by five point four five five times its height. Width and length. That's roughly the equivalent to a cube that's 11.52 inches on each side. Accounting for the margin of error, that's one cubic foot, foot of dog poop. That. See, I have. Is this. Uh, he's around 25 feet tall. He'd produce an estimated 1,300 pounds of. Oh, I don't think this is an official Clifford cartoon. Never mind. Um, also, Clifford would weigh. So, because of the cube square law, he would weigh 87 tons. Yeah. Oh, no, Clifford's body, like, Clifford... Clifford wouldn't be, like, this fun dog running around. He would be, like, this unmoving mass that is, like, slowly... Like, his like his lungs would collapse under the weight of his body. His bones wouldn't be able to hold... <laughs> like, he, he would... Yeah, Clifford. Clifford would just be like a bot, like like at a certain super curse. He would slowly grow and then just just. So eventually, cease, his heart would stop. So this just happens to people that are also very tall. Their your just heart, your heart stops. That's what happened to. Uh, that's what happened to. What's his name? Ta um. Yeah. Andre so the Giant. Like, for Clifford to be real, he'd just be this massive, this unmoving mass with just machines, like keeping him alive. <laughs> We should make a sad Clifford movie. <laughs> what's the name of what's the name of uh Clifford's uh owner? Uh, oh. You have a kid. You should know this. Yeah, but Emily I, Elizabeth. The, I bought her like Sumo Kitty and shit like that. Like those are her books. I'm trying to draw okay. uh, actually for anyone who's interested in Sumo in July 10th is the start of the next um grand tournament for uh, like 15 days. So, good time to start looking into it if you're doing draft picks for Fantasy Sumo. Do not pick uh, uh, Takayasu because he and his whole team of 15 uh, just tested positive for COVID, so they will be withdrawing from the tournament. Oh, yeah. no! <clears throat> and now we're going to get... You know what's going to happen now, Brandon? Because you said COVID. Spotify is going to put one of those little things about about COVID, blah, blah, oh. blah, 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 and like a warning. Oh, I just feel bad because he's my battle bear. He's your battle bear? Takayasu is our battle bear. Uh, so I didn't tell you about this. I, I we're, we're super far off, but like, if this is your first episode, I'm sorry. This is what happens. If this is your 115th episode, you knew what you were fucking getting into. Um, 
So there was a there was a pride secret yeah. layer. Um, so are you familiar with no. what, what secret layers are? So uh, Magic the Gathering has this thing called secret layers that you can purchase, and um, when you purchase the secret layer, you know it's it's special art. You get a set of cards, usually around. Um, if you're paying for the version that's non foil, it's usually around thirty to forty dollars somewhere yeah. in there, right? Um, and they did one for Pride, right? Uh, it was a for the version that I got. I think it was forty dollars. You got, I want to say, ten cards. Yeah. Um, wait, one, two, three, four, five, eight. You get eight cards, right? And then twenty of that uh, that money goes to the Trump Pride. Okay. Uh, one of the cards that they printed in this secret layer. Because you said, you, what did you say? Something about Taka bear? is my battle bear. bear or He's the battle, battle bear. bear. Your battle bear. Yeah. So, um, so relevant to that, uh, one of the cards that they reprinted in this secret lair is Bearski. Now, Brandon. Yeah? It is a Pride Month card. Oh. What do you think the oh, artwork looks oh, like? Oh, I have to look Bearski? No, don't oh, look it up. Just gosh. guess. Right now, bear scheme. Guess what you think it is. I'm about to. I have it. Prime I want to say <laughs> it's a field filled with just like hairy men. You're close. You're very close. Oh no, <laughs> I was very close. Oh, it was really. It's really good. It's fucking Open amazing. I, I have no use for it in any of my decks right now. But um, because like what I really did was I bought. Oh wait, oh, yeah, cool. I bought this. Exile this, two cards from your graveyard. I create bought, a two two green bear uh, creature token. Um, for a for a yeah. three to put out two two to use. That's not bad. Yeah. So the main reason I bought that was for a mana confluence because I needed a mana confluence and that was about yeah. the going rate. And then also, also I was donating to the Trevor Project, which is a pretty uh, worthwhile charity. But anywho, the roundabout. Well, the long story short is Clifford the Big Red Dog. Probably not a kaiju, definitely on a breathing machine. Yes. Um, so, uh, the classical representation of the Mubozo is usually around 10 meters tall, so that's about, like, you know, 30 feet high. So I guess, I guess an Ubi Bozo could be Clifford the Big Red Dog, though. He could, oh, he could definitely beat Clifford. Huh? The Ubi Bozo could yeah. beat Clifford? I mean, if he's in the sea, but if if it's on land, I think Clifford's going to take the W. Well, the, we both assuming uh, assuming this is this is fictional Clifford and not reality. Clifford. Yeah, 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 not reality Clifford. Because <laughs> reality Clifford loses every yeah, time. Yeah, really, reality Clifford just has a vat of fresh blood that has to be pumped in and out of his veins. It's like the uh, the giant baby from China, Illinois. What? Have you never seen the giant baby? Giant baby. Have you never seen China, Illinois? I'm just doing uh, Illinois. I, I've never heard of China, Illinois. Uh, it's the you know the you know the song that goes like Washington, Washington. Oh, I've seen China. Native radiation. Yeah, I've seen this. Yeah, they have a there's a giant baby and they like it. It basically can't function because it's so large yeah exactly yeah um but anywho the uh the umi bozo can be much smaller in some stories with some saying that these smaller umi bozo are actually child forms of the creature indicating that at least in some traditions umi bozo are in some way shape or form capable of reproduction which also kind of pulls away from the whole ura thing in my opinion yeah now, in terms of the or the origin of Umi Bozo, it's a bit vague. Yokai Yokai.com asserts that there exists a legend where the Umi Bozo is a manifestation of a dead priest thrown into the sea by angry villagers. Which cool. Metal. Uh in this telling, the name Umi Bozo would not originate from his appearance so much as it would from its provenance, because then it would be a sea priest. Yeah. Like, literally. Um Additionally. Uh, if this were the case, I would be more willing to classify an Umibozo as Onryo, because it actually resembles a separate type of uh, Onryo, which we'll be talking about in a bit, uh, but because its its behavior would likely be driven by rage and a Tatari and all that good stuff. Uh, but the origin is a bit questionable. 
Um, and the only reason I have that for that is the only excellent source of the legend is from yokai.com. Uh, and there's no references to Japanese materials citing that on there. Although I did find a book that was published in like 1994 that supposedly has this in it. But that also doesn't necessarily mean that it's true because it's a book. It's a book about yokai from 1994 released yeah. in Japan. And it's like an illustrated book about it. And I think um, I think the first episode in this list comes from that book. Uh, the first image in this, this like episode that I have. Oh, gotcha. With the boat. Comes from that book. Yeah. Um, and not only that, I couldn't. So there are about like. 10 in libraries of that book. And none of them are in libraries anywhere near here. Oh, perfect. Because I checked the library system for it to see like how hard it would be to get a hold of. Yeah. It, it's that it's not oh, happening. I caught a case of the sads doing research for an, a, a, a copy I was writing last week where like mm-hmm. I thought I found the source, but when I went to the um, website, which was that of a library, it said, because um, it was a database, and it said, unfortunately, this database is no longer um, maintained because the librarian who used it retired. So, like, some guy as a librarian just had, like, a passion project keeping a database of, like, records of something. And ever since they retired, oh, no. it stopped. I was like, oh, I would have loved. That's depressing. I would have loved to have access to that. But it's, uh, yeah. Um, so, regardless, beyond this answer uh, as to what an Umibozo is, um, I-, I don't have a succinct good answer for it. Really just seems like a sea monster, right? Yeah. There's no, like. There's no, like, mystical provenance to it that I could find. So, like, there's no, like, legend linking it. It just seems to be a thing, right? Like, kind of like a will-o'-wisp or, yeah. you know, something along those lines. Or a fairy or a fae, right? It's just... It just is, right? Like, it's just a fact of reality. Yeah. Um. So, in terms of what the Umibozo does, it's largely a terror to Japanese fishers, right? Like, that's the... That's who it attacks okay. because it makes sense because they're the people who are on the ocean the most. Uh, at least in the time period that Umibozo is most frequently seen. In the most prevalent version of the story, uh, the creature rises from the sea, from generally calm seas, uh, and then when the Umibozo arrives, there's some kind of arrival of the storm. As well, the Umibozo is associated with feelings of dread and other anomalies on the ocean. Um, although every source says other anomalies on the ocean, but doesn't give a single other anomaly <laughs> yeah. that it it is like associated with beyond the fact that it's a giant head rising out of the ocean. Yeah. Um so the the other thing too is uh feelings of dread in my opinion, once you're on open water, that's just called being on open water. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I just hate I hate open water. The idea of being on open water terrifies me. So I, I hate the idea of cruises. And it's not just because I hate the idea of how wasteful cruises are. I hate the idea of cruises because it's like, why the fuck are we deciding to go on the ocean for fun when we don't need to be on the ocean, when we could just fly over the ocean, and we're just inviting <coughs> a fucking row wave to come and murder us. That it, and then the sharks uh... get us. That, that one, like, there's no reason to be on the ocean. Two, there's no reason to be trapped in a confined space with that many people and, like, finite resources. Like, that, everything seems bad. Nothing seems good about a cruise. The entirety of a cruise sounds like my, like, living nightmare. Yeah, it's like, a, everything that I hate is a cruise. <laughs> I mean, the inf- the buffets are fine, but, like, everything else... Everyone likes a good buffet. Yeah. Although not recently. I can't remember the last time I went to a buffet. I haven't gone... Because COVID. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I have a week uh, off coming up. I might go to a buffet. Like, in the mi- like early morning on a weekday. When there's, like, fucking nobody. All the old folk. All the old folk, yeah. But who, mm, yeah, but they're so bitter. I mean, frail. Like, what? 
no i'm my i think old folk are a little bit more timid um or or tend to be safer because they're they're uh going to die soon anyway and then plus if they I, get the covid i strongly disagree with that sentiment but okay well let, let me the the old folk in my family that's how they are they're okay cool. very that's that's not most old folk oh yeah, because like my grandma, when she comes up from Texas, she's like she's quarantining for a week before she sees any of us, and like she That's she fair. like said that in text, like just as a heads up, when I get here, I'm not gonna see you guys because I'm gonna be hanging out on my own for like a week to make sure I'm good. And we're like, okay, and my husband's like, well, you know, wait a few days and then take a test, and but yeah. yeah. I mean that's that's the correct play because you know we are still in the middle of a pandemic. Regardless of what anyone says, it is still a pandemic. Yeah. Um, but anywho, so uh, when the world wasn't in the throes of a pandemic, it was being attacked by Umibozo, apparently. Hell yeah. Um, and if the, if the Umibozo doesn't destroy the ship when they rise up from the sea, um, they will ask a fisherman for a bucket or a barrel. Okay. Do they... What's their intent? Uh, to pour water into the ship and... I feel like as a giant sea monster, there's an easier way for you to sink a ship than requesting <laughs> your victim to like, give you the instrument by which you will do such a thing. Brandon, how do you think that you can escape uh, escape an Ubi Bozo? Don't really quick. Don't read. I won't read. Don't give it a bucket. <laughs> no, give it a bottomless bucket, as in a bucket that you punch the bottom out on. That's so funny, and it's just like. <gasps> There's nothing else I could possibly do with this giant body. You have defeated me. This bucket has a hole in it. Yeah, it um, it, it just is like it just confuses them. Like it confuses them so much that they <laughs> just like can get away. Um, they can, which speak, is funny, but they don't understand the concept of hole. No, no, they're from the ocean. Hole don't exist in ocean. Oh. Just more water. Just more water. Um, oh. But anywho, if they don't give them a bottomless barrel, the Umibozo will drown the crew, um, which is confounding, because how the fuck do we know that? How do we know that? But also, if you have two buckets of equal volume, mm -hmm. presumably you could drain the water from the ship as fast as the Umibozo can put water into the ship. Uh, I don't know if that's true. It's supernatural. Yeah. That's, that's just the facts of the matter. Um, interestingly, uh, the, this particular story is very similar to the Funayure, which translates roughly to boat spirit, um, which is an actual Anri, uh, which will attack the living. So the Funayure are the spirits of deceased fishermen who drowned in shipwrecks, and uh, manifest in human forms in contrast to the less than humanoid appearances of the Mubozo. Now, being Onryo, they extract their vengeance on the living, uh, seeking to kill the living, adding to their numbers, which is a very particular, like, variation on this one. So, like, yeah. they're kind of, they're kind of, like, they got some zombie vibes to them, uh -huh. right? Um, but they're, they're, they're Onryo. Oh. Uh, so, uh, in their case, they will use ladles and barrels to fill the ships to the living to eventually sink them. I really think they need some instruction on how to more efficiently perform the task at hand. I mean, because, like, you're you're dealing with, like, a, a ship's worth of people if you've got, like, a group of funere. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of, like, late, like, I have, I own, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a ladle owner. I'm trying to think by volume how many, how much work would it be to fill a vessel enough where you'll like start to combat the, its buoyancy. Like, I mean, it depends. So there's a lot of factors there. Like, is it is it a filled vessel? Is it like on the verge of like whatever? Because that could be a thing, right? Yeah, it's sometimes fully they, loaded. They, yeah, um, but also you're you're also not considering the fact that it might be a large ass ladle. Oh, are they bringing their own ladles? They're not borrowing a human size. No, they're label? bringing they're bringing ladles. Oh. They've got the ladle. Okay. Yeah. Un unlike the Umibozo, they're prepared. They have their ladles ready. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. 
redacted. I'll I'll give I'll give them a supernatural ladle. Yeah, they got a supernatural ladle. Uh, there are a number of ways to counteract the Funiere, uh, including stopping the ship and just staring at it. <laughs> just weird it out. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, throwing stuff in the water. Okay. Uh, stirring the water with a stick. And uh-huh. my absolute per- personal favorite is saying, Washiwa Dozamunda. Which translates roughly to, I am a drowned person. So just tell it, uh, yo, like, you can't, I, I'm already dead, so like, you know, let's move on. We're the same, dude. Don't worry. We're the same. <laughs> that is that is how you defeat a Funayere. That's so good. That's like if we are all dead, like if they would just go like, oh, we, I'm, no, I'm already like you, so, you know, let's mm-hmm. move it. And, and I mean, that's the show ends. <laughs> that's that's basically the play in any zombie movie where they disguise themselves as zombies. Yeah, true. Right. Like or that scene from the Black point. Sheep where they like disguise themselves as a sheep. Not about that. It's a it's movie been a while that exists. since I saw that movie. It's uh, I, I'm sure we talked about it before. It's a sheep where when you get bit, you turn into a were sheep. It takes place in New Zealand. The transformations are pretty cool. And if you're wondering, like, oh, Brandon, that sounds like a B-horror movie that you stumbled across when FYE was a thing. You could just buy random, you know, cheap movies there. Um, you'd be wrong. It was made by Weta Workshop, you know, the Lord of the Rings people. I'm looking up when Black Sheep came out. Uh, because, because I don't know... 96? No, that's not right. No, that's it. Oh, no, that's, 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 that's the, the comedy. That's the you comedy. Have, you have to specify um, horror 2007. Movie. Yeah, two, 2006. 2006. 2006. Yeah. Um, what was the budget? Its box office was $5 million. Oh, you can watch it for free on Tubi right now. Yeah, or I'll mail you my DVD. <laughs> I feel like that's a waste of money. Yeah, but I, uh, I, it's 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 a novel idea, and it was all of the uh, effects are practical, which is very cool. And also, there's a scene that's fucking gross because they're in a pit filled with um, they're in a pit and they filled it with real meat from like local butcher shops, and it got hot. So apparently, that was like shitty to like shoot. It was pretty low fi- low budget though. Um, it was $5 million budget. Yeah, like, basically anything that wasn't a practical effect, like, that's that's where the budget was. It went to Weta Workshop. Fair enough. So like, That's exclusively where it went. Doesn't Weta Workshop do practical effects? They did the practical, yeah. They did Lord that's of the, like, thing. that's their thing. They released a board game that, like, has been sitting in Kerwin's and Poughkeepsie for, like, ever. The robot one? Yeah, no one wants to buy it because it's like $150 and the idea is you're supposed to buy it as like a group of people, but like yeah. nobody wants well, to do that. The idea is you're supposed to buy it if you're into like super high fidelity models. Yes. And like most people... if you're already a collector of like high, f- like expensive, like resin models that you collect and like customize, then that's your shit. So if they they found a really niche population to try to market that to. Yeah, pretty much. And for whatever reason, Kerwin thought that people were going to buy it around here. Um, but anywho, so while investigating this particular folkloric link, I kind of fell down a bit of a rabbit hole reading about Japanese death legends. Um, oh, cool. Which is something I'm going to... Oh, they did the effects for Stranger Things. Did they? Yeah, I could see that. They, Stranger Things... The Witcher, Dark Crystal, Labyrinth. They the did Hobbit, not do. Lord of they the did Rings. not do the effects for the the, the labyrinth. There's no way. Uh, Rings, Have they been around that long? Because that was that was Jim Henson. That was yeah. They're old as fuck. Well, so was um. Uh, Eighty seven as was Archie. Jim Henson effects. Also, Dark okay, Crystal. Okay. Huh. I think they've been around for a hot minute. They're not, like, a new place. They're, like, just a place that's been around forever doing, um, like, high-end special I effects. don't see uh, Labyrinth on their 
on their their list. But they do have Meet the Feebles, oh, which is a um, an interesting film. Uh, also known as Frogs of War. <laughs> uh, they did the Tommyknockers, Xena Warrior Princess, Lord of the Rings, Hellboy. Oh, they did the 2005 King Kong movie. Eel Girl. I've never heard oh. of that. Well, that's an image. Oh, they did the 2017 okay. Power Rangers movie, which was interesting. Uh, anywho, so returning to my uh, my investigation of Japanese uh, death legends, I'm not going to talk about them a lot on here because like that has nothing to do with this. Um, because I what I was trying to do was finding a site a source that actually linked to the Funiere to the Omibuzo that was cited on Wikipedia. Uh, because that was the one that yeah. I was like, well, if that's the case, that might actually have the the ghost, like the the dead priest legend, right? Because then, yeah. then there might be like some kind of causal link where might we might be able to at least draw a conclusion that there is a reasonable assumption that this could be a myth that existed, right? Because mm-hmm. um, if if you haven't guessed, I'm not calling this like a real thing at all, so. I feel like it's. I feel like it's kind of obvious on this one. Giant heads popping out of the o- ocean yeah. is not really like a thing. Um, small heads popping out of the ocean now—that's a possibility, as well as feet. But that's a whole other podcast. Um, so the source is in fact real. Um, and this is the one I was talking about earlier, where there's like only a handful of college libraries that have it, and the closest one is about four hours. Uh, well. I'm four hours away from the library that I have access to, the college library. And then I don't know if my college library is in an in a exchange network with any of these college libraries. So I would have to, one, put in a request for the book. Two, wait for that request to go through. If it goes through, I would then have to drive four hours to Rochester to get the book. Um, If I read it, if I scanned it there, I could just scan it there and bring it back. Or I bring it back. And then, like, within a week, I have to drive another four hours back out, and then another four hours back. So we're dealing with 16 hours worth of driving for the sake of uh, one story in a book. So I decided, nah, I'm not going to do that. There's, You're forgiven. We forgive um, you. So I went for looking for a digital reproduction, which doesn't currently exist, which is not super uncommon for a lot of Japanese uh, books, because a lot of them are... A lot of, like, these, like, the way that Japanese, like, literature and uh, academia works is a lot different than, like, American academia, and they're, like, usually printed as books, right, that they sell, and, like, it's it's a very different culture in terms of, like, academic scholarship and these and those things. Um, so, uh, as a result, a lot of stuff doesn't get scanned. Um, it, it has to be something that somebody has, like, a real stated interest in. And even then, uh, sometimes people will, like, people who collect um, ghost stories and stuff like that aren't always the type of people who will be the ones to scan it. Uh, it's not like it's action figures or some, some other useless shit that exists out there. <laughs> uh, which is cool, because I actually got, I got a, a magazine that I wanted. Um, I got a yeah. scan of it, because I wanted a scan of all of the uh, Super Sentai mecha that have ever existed. Um, yeah. and I was able to find a, uh, a magazine of that, and it was originally stored on a hentai site. Oh, great. Yeah, they started on a, a hentai site, because there was, like, another version, so there was the public-facing version, and then there was, there was a back, like, a behind version that was only accessible yeah. through, uh, like, log, like, user logins. Right? Yeah. So they posted all sorts of shit that was like DCMA non compliant to it. Yeah. So they wouldn't have to like worry about takedown notices. That's funny. Um That's right. I love that you were like like I should figures or other useless shit. And I can see the wall behind you. I know, it's useless shit. <laughs> I love it, but it's useless shit. Um Story of my life. So not really. 
just me loving action figures and a few useless shit. It's pretty much the only thing. And me buying random ass magic cards that I don't need. Um, so after not finding that, I did find a book by uh, Michiko Iwasaka and Bare Tolkien, um, which I think cited the legend, like that book, right? Um, yeah. so that was how I found it, like, through reverse citation lookups and all that sort of stuff. Um, and the book was called Ghosts in the Japanese, Cultural Experiences and Japanese Death Legends. Now, it doesn't verbally explicitly link, uh, the Umibozo to the Funayure, um, but uh-huh. they did include one of the images of the, uh, Umibozo in a section on the Funayure. So, uh, at the very least, there's some context in which there can be a link between the two. Whether or not okay. that was intentional or not, like, in, like, they were trying to express the fact that the Umiboso is, in fact... <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. The Umiboso is, in fact, a Funayere? I don't know. But there is potential that the that there, there might be an avenue for the deceased holy man uh, version of the legend. Yeah. Now, um, in contrast to a lot of yokai, uh, which are usually linked to, like, specific locales, right? Mm -hmm. Um, like, the, the tanuki has specific areas that they're active in, um, Mm -hmm. that, like, weird wheel thing has specific areas, those giant, uh, Home Depot skeletons I was talking about before, they, uh, they, they are found around, like, sites of tragedy and bat, like, war and things along those lines. So usually there's, like, a common like there there's a there's a factor that keeps them more or less tethered to an area. Mm-hmm. Umi bows are a little different because they're more or less ubiquitous in Japanese coastal lore, right? Because there's sea okay. literally fucking everywhere and fishermen yeah. and, and and boat pilots and all that good stuff, they'll they'll go fucking everywhere. So like the there's a higher degree of diaspora of that particular legend. Um so while it's broadly the same class- classification of yokai, um, there are a lot of regions in Japan that uh, modify the Umibozo story, which not modifies not only its appearance, but behaviors as well. Now, there's a lot of these stories that people claim to be Umibozo, mm-hmm. but I'm pretty sure they're not. They just, uh, they just slapped an Umibozo name on top of it. Um, and I'd actually be more interested. Fuck! <sighs> <laughs> god damn it i can't stop yawning um i'd be way more interested in uh i would be i'd be more likely to to god that yawn fucked me up um <laughs> i'd be more more interested in conflating these stories with Hunayure than umibozo um which would be basically they would be cousins to the umibozo okay Right. Okay. Um. So I'll be mentioning a few of my favorites from this, but I'm not 100 percent sure that all of these are things that I would be comfortable in calling uh, Umibozo. And it's actually pretty interesting because, like, all the examples are the same everywhere you go. Mm-hmm. And the Japanese Wikipedia section, uh, for the Umibozo folklore is literally identical to the legends by area section of English Wikipedia. If you do a mm-hmm. translation, it is literally like one to one identical. So somebody went on Japanese Wikipedia, copy and pasted it, and just dropped it in Wikipedia. <laughs> okay. So there's that. Um, in the like the stories like barely vary too. So I included links to both, but like realistically speaking, you can read the English one and it pretty much has everything. Um, so. Regardless, beyond merely having the bottom a bottomless bar- barrel handy, some regions had means to prevent the arrival of the Umibozo. In the Tohoku region, a custom exists in which the first fish, fish caught while fishing should be sacrificed to the goddess of the sea. Couldn't find a specific goddess, which is a little unfortunate, because I would be interested to see if there was like, a tradition for this particular goddess or other rituals along these lines. Mm-hmm. Just... Or she's just super horny for fish. I mean, most most sea goddesses are super horny for fish, like yeah. demonstrably, and and that has been documented. There is a degree of horniness for fish. Um, I mean, some of them probably fuck fish. That's probably where some weird demigods come from. 
maybe Dagon is like half fish. Body. Or they like give birth to like the original fish, and that's where all fish come from. I mean, that's where seahorses or horses come from, basically. A lady gave birth to a horse. And I think that's where Nep- horse I think from? Neptune fucked something, or he made a, a horse, or something along those lines. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's one of those it's one of those ones where it's like, uh, I don't know. Um. So if if this this ritual is not carried out, the goddess will exact a terrible vengeance on the captain in their boat. Uh, not only will the ship be destroyed, but the captain will be kidnapped with literally no hope of recovery. Uh, oh, good. Yeah, so so the rest will be left to, like, drown or drift. But the captain, yeah. he's fucking dead. Because okay. it was his fuck. Uh, in the Mie prefecture, and I don't know if I pronounced that right, uh, there exists a belief that the Umibozo was most active at the end of the month. As such, boats were not allowed to launch to mitigate the risk of death by Umibozo. Interestingly, huh. there is a story where one sailor decides to break the tap and goes to sea. Now, while at sea, of course, the sailor encounters an Umibozo, who instead of asking for a bucket says, am I terrified? And now, Brandon, this sailor, I'm, I'm giving him credit as being the world's first millennial. Okay. <laughs> because his response was, I find nothing as terrifying as trying to make my way in the world. Fair. Which All is right. the most <laughs> the most millennial response, the most relatable sentence I've ever heard from what I presume yeah. to be an Edo period Japanese man. <laughs> um, Perfect. So at this point, the Umibozo disappears, probably depressed by the sailor's response. <laughs> uh, I heard. Um, I heard. It was so good. I heard somebody say something along the lines of. So, the whole Ro- Roe v. Wade thing happened, which, you know, yeah. I don't think it's going to be difficult to suss out what our podcast's feelings are about that, um, uh-huh. based on our history. So, I'm not going to say them outright, because uh, also, we're both white men, so we have literally no bearing on deciding what happens to a woman's body, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> so, like, we'll argue... Maybe the, our our genre exclusively does and that could be problematic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. So, uh, somebody somebody was like, all these boomers asking, "How would you feel?" Uh, asking millennials, "How would you feel if your mother aborted you?" Are not going to be getting the response that they want. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, yeah. <laughs> And I was like, I, I think I liked it because I was just like, yeah, that's that's pretty fucking fair. Yeah. Um. So, millennial aside, uh, there are also stories of the smaller Umibozo, which differ greatly in pattern from their possibly adult forms. Uh, given the smaller size, they attack ships in a different manner. Um, they will latch onto the side to try to weigh it down or pull down the mast with stretching arms. Uh, nice. The Umibozo will target fires on the ship, uh, quenching them and placing soldiers in dangerous situations where sailing where they're sailing at night. In some legends, uh, tobacco smoke will repel them, so perhaps they're seeking to extinguish anything that might generate tobacco smoke. Um, that might be an interesting hole to look into. Right, tobacco smoke seems to be like a universally spiritual thing no matter like yeah. which culture you're looking at yeah i mean the it, it it's it's a it is much a, very much a thing right it's like yeah but like i mean it's more be, i think it's more because it's like an ubiquitous thing that like people have found out you can smoke and then they've just been smoking forever because addiction yeah it's your biggest but i don't know i don't know where it likes to live um so like It seems like pre, like, before, like, mass trade was a thing, Mm -hmm. it it was still, like, a commonly spiritual thing. And it's totally, I mean, everyone also has, like, spirituality around, like, the ocean and shit like that. So I guess it's not surprising, but... Yeah, I mean... No, it's just interesting that it's, like, a universal thing. uh, 
I mean, that, that there's a lot of things like that, right? Like, I mean, even alcohol has its original uses. Yeah, true. Right? Um, plus, I think tobacco as a ritual thing is very specific. Like, it's that's a... What is te- tobacco made to? Is it everywhere? There, there, there was a, it has to be, because it's so... It's in so many different cultures. No, it has to be everywhere. It's not. No, it's indigenous so it's, to North and South America. Trade. It's post. It's po- post us going to America. Um, it looks like, uh, except of course, obviously for uh, indigenous groups. Yeah. So um, it looks like the Japanese were first in North and South America. The okay. Japanese were first introduced to tobacco by Portuguese sailors in 1542. Oh, okay. Interesting. So I think I think that it might also just be that the uh the the tobacco like traditions of indigenous people from America might have just carried with them. Like there might have been just like a carry out, so to speak. Right? Yeah. Um Of course I also think that tobacco was treated differently in pre Columbian days. Um and like not used in the same way, but I could be wrong. Uh, yeah, it was mostly used for medical treatment of physical conditions, painkiller, uh, smoking mixtures for treating cold. It seems like it was more used for medicine than it was for like in like pipe ceremonies and such along those lines, as opposed yeah. to like uh, as opposed to what what Europeans did, where they uh, got super fucking addicted to it and over like farmed it to a point. Yeah. Uh, because you know, as they tend to do white people. Uh, so white people, the smaller creatures of the, uh, Umibozo are also very vocal crying. Kya kya when attacking, which is basically a Pokemon move. Um, yeah. And exclaiming Oitata when being hit by an oar. <laughs> Which, they're both just, like, onomatopoeias for the noises that they make. Yeah. Um, so there also exist stories of hairy Umubozo, and Umubozo who can shape nice. shift into the form of beautiful women. These would appear to be lost in the ocean, and then inflict grievous harm on their victims who stop to help them. Right? So, like, they'd be pretending to be trapped or stranded in the ocean, and then, like, they get yeah. help, and yada, yada, yada. But realistically, this seems more like a mermaid legend than uh, Umabozo to me. So yeah, it seems that like that that's a common legend everywhere too. Yeah. Is like the the lady at sea who who then does. Yeah, things. I mean that's that's I, I, I mean like if we're gonna be real. There's a bunch of you have a bunch of men on a boat who haven't seen a woman in months. Yeah, that might, I think that might be a, a a common story that happens to like. Try to dissuade uh, uh, sailors from uh, doing anything untoward or being unfaithful while at sea. Or, like, trying to fuck dolphins. In general. Don't fuck a dolphin. No, dolphins fuck you. Don't, even if that... Mm-hmm. They will. They dolphins will. Dolphins fuck you. You don't fuck a dolphin. The dolphin fucks you. That's just facts. <laughs> yeah. Where do you think they're gonna put that nose? Mm. They'll use their penis if they're a male dolphin. <laughs> they will. <laughs> they're like the only like they, they're one of the I think they're one of. And they're gonna do that laugh th- while they do it. They're like one of the only species that uh, engages in sex for like recreation. Besides humans, there's like a very small number of species that does that, and like. Dolphins, monkeys. I, I don't actually even know how uh, much recreational sex happens with monkeys. Well, I think the uh, bonobos are like no. Oh well, for bonobos it. are bonobos are also chimpanzees and not monkeys. Oh, eh, eh, <laughs> same. <laughs> um, because like, because like, I know that. Well, there's the there's of course the the infamous frog video with a, a chimpanzee. Um, I'm sure you you've heard of that one. And then the guy who fell asleep. What? The guy fell asleep at a zoo with his hand next to the monkey cage, and the monkey started fucking his hand. <laughs> <laughs> you, you never saw no, that. I don't want to really. 
Um, dolphins will actually use fish heads. That's a thing. Um, so, in a surprising twist for the Umobozo, there's actually a relatively modern appearance of it. Um, which was a surprise. Yeah. So, in April of 1971, a fishing vessel called the 28th Kanpiramaru was headed from Japan to New Zealand to fish for tuna. The long line, which I found out is literally just a long line that has a fuck ton of bait on it, um, snapped and a large creature emerged from the ocean. It had gray-brown wrinkles all over its body and large 15-centimeter eyes. Further, it had no mouth and a collapsed nose. Uh, only the top half of the huh. body, which was about 1.5 meters, was visible with the bottom obscured by murky water. When the fisherman attempted to poke it with a harpoon, it disappeared back into the sea. Now, apparently the Oceanography Department of Japan, uh, which I'm like 90% sure is a translation error, is said to investigate the creature, but I can't find any evidence of the action uh, or any results of the story. It was in a newspaper in Japan that I can't, I don't have access to because I don't think it's been digitized. And also, you know, it's... If you don't speak a Japanese, it turns out it's notoriously hard to find any Japanese sources. Yeah. Although I've had some 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 luck just switching Google into the uh turn everything into English mode. I do I do have an auto translator installed on my on my lap yeah. on my uh my browser because of the number of times I've had to use it for this podcast. And to buy anime thing or mecha from Japan, which is another useless shit thing I do. Um so, in terms of what the Umibozo actually is, I don't really have a definitive answer to explain it, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's literally no physical evidence, so, like, trying to even explain it is a fool's errand, right? Um, but there are yeah. some common elements in the telling of the legend that we can make a few educated guesses. So, in some cases, people might think that it might be, like, a large ocean sea turtle, right? That's just misinterpreted, or a giant jellyfish, or something along those lines. Uh, additionally, thunderhead clouds rising on the horizon, uh, which herald inclement weather soon. That would be dangerous for the crew. So, like, the Umabozo effectively became a personification of the storm. Uh, and it was more or okay. less just, like, a legend that made it more interesting than, like, fuck, nature hates us. Um, nature hates yeah. everybody. Uh, but one of the more interesting ones that I uh, found was uh, the appearance of rogue waves. And if you don't know, a rogue wave is a wave that can strike without warning many times larger than the weather would suggest. So, like, there's usually, like, an average wave for an area. A rogue wave can be, like, twice the height of the average wave or, like, the theoretical maximum wave. The, the, they're twice the height, and they also... I, I don't think it's... It might not be perpendicular, but it does not move in the same orientation as the other waves around yes. it. Which is why they're so dangerous is because when you're sailing, you try to hit the waves long, you know, long way. So you're like, you know, hitting your nose into them, which will prevent your boat from tipping over. And the rogue wave is dangerous because it comes from a different angle, one that you're not uh, oriented towards, making it more likely to uh, uh, tilt yeah, the boat. Yeah, it's, it's super dangerous. Um, in this particular hypothesis, the Umabozo would be a folkloric way to reference rogue waves and explain their occurrence. Same thing as like the, the Thunderhead. Um, but we should also note that rogue waves, we didn't have any evidence, physical, like, physical evidence, like, any measurements of it before January 1995. What? Yes. That seems crazy to me. Yes. Because there was a rogue wave that was detected by the Dropner platform, which I think was somewhere outside yeah. of, like, a Scandinavian country. Um... Mm -hmm. And, like, the wave was twice as, more than twice as tall as the average height of the waves at the location. That was the first time we ever detected one in the wild. That's nuts. Yeah, but then again, like, also consider how much, how long have we been, ha how long have we had, like, uh, like, proper, proper ways, ways to, to measure, measure it. it. In addition, yeah. road waves frequently happen, like, in the middle of the ocean. Right? Yeah. So it's a little bit different. They're not easy to observe. They're yeah. rare. How do you really exactly. measure such a thing? It, it, we just got lucky with one thing. Also, interestingly, uh, there is a there is a 
opposite form of the rogue wave, and it's called a rogue hole. Wait, like, so the wave, like, basically like a negative yeah. wave where there's just like a sudden dip yeah. that your boat hits? That's fucking yeah. nuts. It's never been observed, but, like, they were able to, they were able to make it happen in a simulation, like in a tank. So that exists, yeah. which is... Well, it makes sense that uh, it... All... It would... Exist. All of this, all this is, Brandon, to me, is more reason. I've never thought about it existing. Don't go on a more fucking reason cruise. not to go on a fucking cruise. Don't go on a cruise. A rogue hole. Yeah. Oh, I got a, I got a dirty joke on that, but I'm not gonna say it. There's, I was just thinking of some dirty um, jokes. So, as a brief aside, before we finish the episode. There are other instances of seaborne cryptids that are named sea monks, wildly. Um, despite the similarity of the translated names, however, sea monks and umibozo are wildly different creatures, right? Which sea monks are almost definitely rays, like like partially decayed rays and things along those lines. Yeah. But we're not going to talk about this episode because. Quite frankly, I didn't feel like writing an, uh, writing about it, and it didn't have enough of a it didn't have enough thematic like similarity to the Mubozo, in my opinion, to be an actually coherent episode. Um, there is one thing though that I found uh, that I didn't put in the copy because I'm really not sure of it. So, okay, you're familiar with Hedora, right, Brandon? Yes. So Hidora. What H I D O R? Yeah, eight. eight uh, yeah, Hidora. He's. I'm trying to remember what it is. I I know. I know. I know. It. I'm just trying to remember. It's, what it's it a is. kaiju from the Godzilla franchise. Oh, yeah, it's, it's made of pollution. Like that's its whole gimmick. Yes. Um. And it's like effectively a bunch of like tadpoles that can fuse together to make a giant like, nightmare creature. Uh, so yeah, I saw the Umibozo picture like the start of the episode. And I'm like, oh, that's Hidora. Oh, but it turns out it's kind of not. I couldn't find any like evidence linking Hidora to the Umibozo. Although, although Weird. the recent Netflix series has a painting in it that has a bunch of Umibozo that look vaguely like, uh. Hedora. I could definitely, yeah. He so, yeah. like, like they're, huh. like, this image from, uh, from the podcast, from, not podcast, from the, the, the anime, it totally looks like Hedora, but it's explicitly Umibozo. Like, there's no doubt that that is an Umibozo, right? Because its behavior is very, it's yeah. like, the depiction is almost identical to the, the picture from the start of the episode. Um, but it's yeah, and they're almost identical. Actually, I would I won't even say almost identical. They're identical. Well, yeah, because that those images, those images are deliberately identical because they're like they're referencing. Hedora. Okay, because because in this universe, Godzilla yeah. isn't really from our universe. From that universe, he's from an alternate universe, and there's a whole bunch of like stupid science -y shit relevant because it's a Godzilla property so they talk about a bunch of stupid bullshit science shit that doesn't actually mean anything um, so yeah but I, I mean I'm not I don't think Hedora was the inspiration for the Umbozo but like they're remarkably similar yeah they're very also, similar I, suspiciously similar Hedora come out I think that was like Seventy. Let me look up. Seventy-one. Godzilla versus Hedorah okay. was seventy-one. So uh, that was that was literally the same year as the as the supposed other Umibozo was discovered or found. Cited. So yeah. So yeah. I don't know. Huh. It's unlikely because the the Godzilla movie would have been in production before then, and uh, I think because it was. April of 1971, and usually Godzilla movies release. Yeah, the Godzilla movie released in July on July 24th. So um, it has. It's just a weird happenstance of like 
the universe being weird. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's though. all I got for the episode. Uh, so thanks again to our buddy Will Smith out there who suggested this. Um, if you enjoyed the podcast, be sure to leave, like visit our website at CryptopediaCast.com. Instagram at CryptopediaCast and Twitter at CryptopediaCast for updates on when the show is going to be released. Um, the email is CryptopediaCast at gmail.com or also CryptopediaCast.com. We have a Patreon. Uh, the link is in the show notes. And Brandon, can you thank our jackalopes this week? That's right. So this week, we're going to thank Clay Sinclair, Marty Von Part, Marty, Marty Von Potty. But I got Boston for a second. Uh, Marty Von Party, Bird Schneider, Lenwood Shark, Matthew Smith, Bushcraft, Kelso, and Will Smith. Uh, if you enjoy the podcast, be sure to rate, review, subscribe on things. Our rating went down on Spotify. I was sad. Um, oh. but it's okay. Also, uh, on the Discord, on the Discord, there is, oh, the I'm, gonna, I'm gonna probably put a, post a link to it in the show notes. Um. Pin it. Yeah, post a link. So I didn't. So I, we, I also so didn't. It's in there. I'm not submitting for anyone that. Uh, if you submitted upon one, it. I'm not going to submit an additional one for it for us as a as a as a as a creator. A second one. I put one in. I yeah. Like, I don't want them to be all like motherfuckers. Um. So there is a paranormality yeah. mag, which is asking for you to nominate your favorite uh, podcast for the 2022 paranormal. Um. And, uh, it's a very credulous magazine, uh, and I think it would be fucking hilarious if we even got, like, an honorable mention. So, uh, if you're going, if you want to, you can nominate us until July 10th by putting in the podcast name, which is Cryptopedia dash a paranormal podcast. Um, host names would start with Brandon, go with me. And then for category, I would put uh, cryptozoology, comedy, and ghosts and hauntings. I think that would probably be the most accurate one. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just like, also don't subscribe yeah. to your fucking newsletter. Don't do that to yourself. <laughs> it's checked. Don't so check that box or uncheck the box if it's um, checked. But yeah, oh, top twenty-five paranormal chart, paranormal podcast chart, September twenty twenty-one. Stories with Sapphire. Let's get haunted was number one. I don't. So here's the thing about this: they have a very, they have a very specific, like, uh, classification for what constitutes paranormal podcast because there are very, very like popular paranormal podcasts that are not on this list. Like, last podcast on the left talks about the paranormal fucking constantly. Yeah. Not on the list. So, I don't know. Uh, but regardless, I think it would be fucking hilarious to do this. Um, so if you are so inclined, nominate us. Uh, although this may negatively impact our rating on Spotify even more. Oh, that's I, I very possible. Very but I'll take it. I'll take the blow. Um, and if this is what kills the podcast in terms of getting new people, whatever. Uh, but to counteract that, try to share it with people who you think would enjoy it. Um, you know, please, I guess. I don't know. We... We don't really need... We don't make money off this podcast, so, like... If you enjoy it, you enjoy it. We most... All our money goes to web hosting and spirit boxes. <laughs> it does. It does. I, I'm still working on that. I'm still working on a, lo a longer, like, this... thing for the spirit box. Because I want to I wanna do, like, a long-form video about it. Yeah. I've never heard of any of their top 25 podcasts. I've heard of a few of them. Huh. Um, I've heard of Monsters Among Us, uh, but the rest, not as much. I actually have a subscription to Monsters Among Us on, um, huh. 
Pod Interesting. Oh, not Pod Me. Oh, Astonishing Legends was their top, one of their top ten for January 2022. It seems like um the the top ten podcasts uh like varies pretty heavily. Yeah, is all I'm gonna huh. say. Interesting. It's probably in line with like trends. So yeah. I'm sure if one's trending, they're more likely to be voted than one that's been a stable for a while. It's also likely that uh, podcasts have noticed that they're they can do this, so they've you know oh, gone yeah. on the website and like actually done it. Yeah. Also, you have to like you have to like deliberately go out of your way to vote, right? And you have to type the podcast names in. So like, realistically speaking. Not many people are going to want to do that shit. Yeah. Um, in terms of, like, user interface design, it's really bad to actually get, like, real meaningful input. Um, that, uh, and I think... Oh, uh, never mind. I'm not going to shit on their implementation of anything. I am. Okay. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm allowed to, because I, I have a... I'm yeah. getting a PhD literally in human yeah. computer interaction. Really, the way it worked, it, 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 the user should not type should not enter the information for the podcast. Oh, ever. Never. The creator should create that first data field, and then the user would have to check that out of a list of all the options that are available. Yeah. Because otherwise you're going to have typos or people like that do a colon instead of a dash, or maybe mm -hmm. a letter's not capital where another one is. And then every different iteration, even though it's the same podcast, if you dump that out as like in a, as like a database format, they're all different because they're typed a little bit different. So I might, I, I kind of have an inkling that they probably don't have so many that that's a problem. Like, it's a concern that they have. Maybe. But that they also have to, like, at that point, pay a guy to then go look at all the information and then, like, correct anything that's wrong so they all get added properly, and that's... that's Bold of you to assume that they're paying someone to do that. Yeah. I think I've just completely knocked us out of the running for this, by the way. Um... <laughs> So if you have any monster requests with stories or ghosts or aliens or yokai or that weird thing Dale did, um, be sure to send them Dale. in. Because we know Dale, he's up to some shady shit and we gotta keep an eye on him. Because if we don't, Dale will do Dale shit. And that's unacceptable. Shasha! Unless you're Dale listening. In which case, the, the type of Dale shit that you do is fine. If, maybe maybe if if you want to keep yourself safe from a dale you have to empty the first can from a six pack onto the soil and around your house or just like put a bunch of like um info wars things outside of your house like like a bunch of like like little like things to distract them like merch <laughs> It's it's like a it's like a leprechaun trap, you know what I'm talking about, where you put like the, yeah. the like lucky charms in the under a box and then you know that. It's basically yeah. that but with Dales. You like Oh, I almost made a dark joke. Never know. I'll show you a dark joke. Oh no! Brandon Cut that <laughs> <laughs> Definitely that I, I, no, you know what? Definitely, I, 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 definitely cut that, but keep my reaction in, because... I, I'm going to. I'm going to make a spike. Because... Oh, God, Brandon! <laughs> <laughs> I said it was dark. Yeah, but, like, I, was, I wasn't expecting to go that dark. <laughs> Holy shit, Brandon! <laughs> Fucking read your plugs. I'm done. I can't. That was that was like. You could find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com, and my Twitter is at crypto brandon and at Heinz Canada. I just. I'm sorry. I we cut it, but Jesus Christ! What Brandon just said was the darkest thing. Ever. Well, not really. Definitely not the darkest thing I've ever heard. But one of the darkest things I've ever heard uttered with the intent of putting it on this podcast at some point. 
<laughs> um, so my Instagram is at mute 20 7 My Twitter is at JF Dunham. My website is johndunhamgames.com. And my email is john at crypedicast.com. Our art was done by Tom Hill. You could find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com, and his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. And he just did some more work for me, and uh, and, uh, pleasant as always, working with him on stuff. Yeah, Tom's a great dude. Always a good time. Tom's a great dude. Uh, He also does, like, a lot of really serious, like, artwork for people, which is always wild to me when I see, like, in the wild yeah. I, it's crazy when i find it on the wild he'll usually if he does one like it'll be up on his story he'll like repost whatever they yeah. post on their thing but then it'll just be out in the wild and I'll be like wait a minute that because he has a very clear art, he has art a, style he has, he'll, so he'll be like that's tom he has a dis- there's no way that's not tom yeah, he has a very distinctive style and um every time i see it it's like oh hey tom i say it like that anywho uh, as always, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And things are going to get dark, apparently? And weird. <laughs>